day 875 of the Ukrainian war map, also known as the Russo-Ukrainian war. Juzzy here, and today is another update as I take a simplified and down-to-earth approach to some of the most important happenings on the ground in Ukraine. So starting off we'll take a look at those Russian losses as currently Russia sits on more than 564,000 military personnel losses. Add in another 980 in the past day, then as for hardware losses, 5 tanks, 19 APVs, and 55 artillery. Oh, plus one air defense system. Then headed right to the map to various regions throughout Russia that involved a similar set of activities. As with this first example, in a daring act of defiance, members of the Freedom of Russian Legion group, the anti-Kremlin group, infiltrated the Savino airfield in Russia's Perm region. Under cover of darkness, these resistance fighters set ablaze valuable military equipment including army vehicles and not at all shy to upload the footage to social media. Then in another stunning display of internal dissent, another Russian group set fire to a critical military communications relay in the Stalingrad area, these days known as the Volgograd region which was after a period of de in the 1960s, which was oddly enough part of efforts to distance the Soviet Union from the legacy of Stalin. Strange but true. Then moving up north, because in another mysterious incident, in the southwest of the city of Moscow, an electric locomotive erupted in flames at the Petalino railway station, puzzling authorities on the matter. While the motives remain unclear, the act of sabotage has effectively immobilized a piece of railway equipment. So as we can see with three events in one day, Russia's really got to watch out for that enemy within. Then into the Belgorod region as Ukrainian drones, or just the one in this case, struck a new Russian 2S-43 Malva self-propelled artillery system. The attack was conducted by the Achilles unit of the 92nd Assault Brigade. Now it's unclear as to the outcome of this event due to the feed cut from the video, but the very few that Russia has in operation of these platforms seem to be keeping their distance and appear to be otherwise used for more of a combination of a prototype testing or for propaganda purposes. Now it's incredibly difficult to confirm how many of these Russia actually has with this one just being the second that the AFU has noticed in or near to Ukraine. And both times were targeted by the AFU. So it's some pretty expensive and slowly produced equipment that gets rolled out to the Russian army only to be targeted shortly thereafter. Then headed into the Ukrainian map today as just a few hours ago in occupied Luhansk of the Donbass region, four explosions were heard, possibly targeting a helicopter base. Russian media reported that the Luhansk Higher Military Aviation School of Navigators might have been attacked. Not much more is known or shown at this stage, except of course for the typical looking wreckage from the engine of the Attackens missile, one of which seen in the aftermath of this event. And we even saw on closer inspection, produced in March of 2002. So 22 years young. Then headed across on the map to the more southern end of the Donbass as the most activity can be found at the Avdivka axis at the moment in the past day. With for instance a Ukrainian M2A2 Bradley IFV, so the infantry fighting vehicle from the 47th Mechanized Brigade, seen tearing into a Russian held position with its 25mm Bushmaster chain gun fire. And that was on the northern front of this bulging contact point. Then, more generally on the map, we'll swing across to Zaporizhia, so the southern oblast, as Russian forces are reportedly preparing for a new offensive in the region. According to Petro Andrushenko, an advisor to the mayor of occupied Mariupol, as it was stated that troops are being gathered from various areas, primarily Donetsk, and are moving towards Zaporizhia via the little-known midway town of Rozivka, but also through Tokmak as well. This troop movement suggests Russia is building reserves for a renewed assault on the region. Simultaneously, Russian forces are withdrawing units from the Sea of Azov coast, including the Mariupol and Berdyansk areas. Though in this case, redeploying them to the north of the Donetsk region where intense fighting is ongoing. And when we talk about the northern Donetsk region, we're really talking about the Crimea direction. 
Now, the Donbass comprises of Luhansk and Donetsk, which is really hard to see on this map because of the red and darker red signifying different things. So, that is the, the darker red is from the 2014 Donbass invasion, where the lighter red is everything after that. So, this is effectively Donetsk. And as for the Crimea direction I mentioned a moment ago, where to this day we still see a lot of very close combat skirmishes in the forested area just beyond. But as for the potential for large-scale counterattacks by Russian forces in the Zaporizhia Oblast, well, it's quite the distance from major operations in the east, and of course even less ideal in proximity to Russia in the east, so quite some distance away and has always been the Achilles heel for the Russian army from a logistical perspective. Then taking a look around the map, so somewhere in the east we saw a destroyed Russian Giant Sint S, 152mm self-propelled howitzer. Then also, very interestingly, we saw the attempted FPV attack on a Russian helicopter. Although unsuccessful this time by the Wild Hornets unit, the team stated that they have been working for several months to ensure that the enemy helicopters won't escape next time. With them very confidently stating, quote, there's more to come. And we've seen some near misses before like this, but not really as close as this one. As you can see there, the Russian chopper is traveling very close to the ground to avoid radar detection, which is known as nap of the earth or terrain masking or terrain hugging. Then we also saw the curious case of a Russian armored vehicle going full speed, zipping past Russian positions right on the front line on the Abdivka axis, only to come up against some area of denial attacks of the Ukrainian forces as it drove over some type of mine, and possibly a ground loitering quadcopter drone, which the AFU has been known to have them settle on roads, lying in wait, conserving their battery too. Then headed across to some news for today. So France is preparing a significant new military aid package for Ukraine, as reported by the French Ministry of Defense. The package includes 128 VAB armoured personnel carriers, these ones being the somewhat iconic looking French APCs that are a proven platform and can carry up to 10 personnel, with all 128 coming in very handy for the AFU. But also as part of this upcoming announcement, Ukraine is to receive 18 Caesar self-propelled howitzers and 24 AMX-10 lightweight tanks plus other various inclusions such as anti-tank missiles, trucks, and radars. Additionally, France plans to train 2,100 Ukrainian soldiers, equivalent to a French army brigade, for a period of two months, which should start sometime in fall or autumn. Then to some Russian hardware news updates of a sort again. So a German court in Stuttgart has convicted a German-Russian couple for supplying drone parts to Russia in violation of EU sanctions. The man received a prison sentence of six years and nine months, while his common law wife was given a suspended sentence of one year and nine months. The couple reportedly sent approximately 120,000 spare parts and components for Orlan 10 reconnaissance drones to Russia, circumventing the EU embargo. The man used front companies worldwide to facilitate the sales, earning over 900,000 euros from the illegal trade. And so we see stories like this pop up from time to time as Russian efforts to smuggle sanctioned hardware into the country, specifically for the means of waging war, is, well, it's not exactly an ideal place to be in, as Russia has to inherently rely on the global supply chain that has in large part shut them out, causing them to deal in lower volumes and much more expensive black markets, as Russia pays a generous fee for the privilege all in order to get the specific and technologically relevant parts that they need. It's almost a case of Russia needing the West to beat the West. And much of their military is the same, whether it's for jets, components for jets, to air defense batteries, to various weapons platforms. Because Western tech componentry, and specifically not the low-grade Chinese stuff, is paradoxically what the Russian military needs to keep going. And if this was Russia's only problem in the war, which it certainly is not, they'd still have a very big problem on their hands. Then headed to some quite very similar news, at least of a similar nature, but on the civilian front, as Russian airline Azura Air was taking a flight home on its 
lease expired Boeing 767 flight from Antalya in Turkey and set for Moscow, which saw significant delays as 200 Russians were stranded in difficult conditions in almost 40 degrees Celsius or about 100 degrees Fahrenheit temperatures as they were stuck on the runway for hours, not allowed to unboard and grounded all due to engine startup failures with the passengers enduring the heat without any air conditioning. But quite simply, Russia should just stop using these well under maintained Western passenger aircraft as the sanctions bite is still continuing to show its effects. With Russia having a vast fleet of Western passenger aircraft they rely on, making up something like 70% of their airline fleet, which is obviously something that's a very tricky position to be in from a geopolitical standpoint. Now, of course, this latest outcome or situation is much better than, say, failures in the air, but even still, this story does not end well for Russian civil aviation. Then headed across to a couple of quick and lighter funnies to round it all off for today, guys. So for this first one, we see more of the latest cutting-edge 2024 Buhanka vans, the UAZ 452s, being reviewed and putting on display the shoddy workmanship of the latest year's production of the proud Russian quality of 2024. So we see paint, welding, and even rust issues. And this one happens to be in the dealership showroom. And the best part, or worst part, is it's going to set you back just under a cool 2 million rubles, roughly 18,000 US dollars, which is just far too much for this junk. And I haven't even factored in yet that the average salary for Russians is about 12,000 US dollars annually. The quality goes down and the prices go up. Then headed across to a final quick funny where I think it's safe to say that the Russian army has gone full Mad Max now. With this latest edition of a medieval monstrosity. So I suppose the tank shed upgrades weren't enough. So straight to the porcupine design on a wheeled APC. Now, is this effective? Well, it's effective at giving you a free acupuncture session if you get too close to the thing, but not against an FPV drone carrying an RPG warhead with its pinpoint cone-shaped design that will just fly right past or through these rusty looking needles. Or not to mention a double charge from a javelin hit. Or even a quadcopter going for the tires. Dealer's choice, really. So that's it for today, guys. Thanks again for watching. Please continue to like and comment. Just uh, roughly 100 or so more of views to, to hit that subscriber level of 110k uh, if you're willing. And yeah, so thanks again for watching. And I do hope to see all of you guys there in the next one. Cheers.